Hello and welcome to the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. Uh, my name is Chris Jarvis and I'm one of the people lucky enough to work in this, this fantastic building which we hope will be, be opening soon. Um, and uh, welcome to tonight's event. Um, before we get going, uh, a little bit of housekeeping. We are using the webinar jam system uh, tonight. Now, if you have any problems with your connection, there is a large button, red button at the top that says reconnect on it. And if you press that button, that actually should help you to, uh, to rejoin us. Um, the other thing is um, tonight isn't just about obviously hearing from our speaker, it's a chance for you to ask questions. So um, there is on the right hand side of your screen, you'll see there's a chat bar with a, a little space at the bottom for you to type comments in. And at any point in the evening, if you have any questions you'd like to ask tonight's um, expert, then do put them in that chat bar. I'll be collating them during the night and I'll put them all to uh, to our speaker at the end of uh, at the end of his talk so we'll have about 15 minutes for for Q a at the end um, if you uh, if you want to share this talk afterwards we will be putting it on YouTube as well on our YouTube channel so um, if there, there are things in here you'd like to share with uh, with family friends or you know organizations then then do actually you know sort of hit our YouTube channel and share it with them so it might have passed you by, but uh, actually the last decade, uh, 2011 to 20, uh, 2020, was the UN's um, decade of biodiversity. Now, um, certainly it's raised a lot of concern and a lot of publicity, but um, there doesn't seem a huge amount that, uh, that has been achieved in terms of mitigating the, the terrible state of biodiversity in the world. Um, and that's why a group of 22 different um, institutions came together, led by a group of researchers here in Oxford, uh, to try and implement some steps, try and think of some practical steps that could be actually take us forward into the next decade and, and try and mitigate some of the some of the disastrous effects we see on the world around us. Um, so tonight's speaker um, actually is part of that group, uh, the, the mitigation and conservation hierarchy, which is commonly known as four steps to save the earth. And they've been developing some practical steps, four practical steps that can actually be implemented, not just by us as individuals, but by organizations, um, businesses, and for governments as well. Um, so um, looking at the triple challenge we face of climate, biodiversity, and, and social crises, um, our speaker tonight is going to um, explain just how we might actually positively affect the biodiversity around us and positively uh, move forward to living in harmony with our planet in a just and fair society. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Tonight's speaker is Henry Grubb. He's a researcher at the Department of Zoology, and he's currently coordinating a team of researchers um, from across multiple disciplines, um, looking at how to implement those four steps here in the university. In particular, he's looking at landscape use and management of land um, and the production of food in you know, halls and canteens and, and across the university. So look out for some exciting challenges, uh, changes in our, uh, in our cafe when we, when we do reopen. So, um, without further ado, uh, let me introduce you to um, Henry Grubb. Henry, are you there? Hello there, Chris. Wonderful. Lovely to see you. I shall leave you to explain the positive action people can take. Lovely. Thank you very much, Chris. And uh, hello to everybody. Um, wherever you're joining, joining in from, the chat seems to to be a fairly international bunch. So thank you for all joining in. And, and I appreciate it's it's 7 p.m. It's the evening now. So I'm going to try and do a, a, a relatively, um, not upbeat per se, but um, but a relatively uh, engaging talk so that hopefully um, people don't fall asleep too, too early. So I'll try and um, uh, share my screen, um, uh, 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 Chris, and, and hopefully that will that will function well. That's looking lovely, Henry, thank you. Can you see that all right? Yep, that's beautiful. Excellent, lovely. So, um, how we can save the earth in four steps. Um, obviously a little bit tongue in cheek to start off with. It's going to take a little bit more than four steps to, to save the earth, but, um, but hopefully I'll explain uh, why maybe the basis of saving the earth could be, could be just, in, just in four steps. So, as Chris said, I'm Henry Grubb. I'm from the Department of Zoology, uh, and I coordinate a, a group of researchers who are working on implementing these four steps here at the University of Oxford. But this talk isn't necessarily about that. This talk is about outlining actually what the problem is that the world faces, why the solutions that we've tried so far have failed, and what our solution is and how that's going to uh, address issues where where we've gone wrong in the past. So I'm not going to talk too much about the University of Oxford um, today, 
hopefully that will be a whole a whole another discussion for a, for another day. So we're going to start right at the very beginning. We have a few problems. I don't know if anybody's noticed. One of those is climate change, uh, as as Chris said at the beginning. We have put an enormous amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and other greenhouse gases as well through principally burning fossil fuels, but um, other causes as well, including deforestation. This is causing the Earth's temperature to rise. And we know from a, a whole host of data that we have that the rising temperatures that we have experienced shown here from, from 1850 up to up to 2025, slight projection there, um, we know that this has been caused by humans. This is this is not coincidence. This is as a direct result of, of human activity. And we know actually that what we want is we want to try and keep global warming below about one and a half degrees Celsius and definitely below two degrees Celsius. And in order to do that, we will have to reduce the amount of carbon emissions that we are putting out into the into the atmosphere. But the problem we have is that the rate in which we will have to decrease in the future is a lot more rapid than the rate that we have than we have grown in the in the past. So this is a graph going back for about a century of uh, the carbon um, carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere. And as you can see, it's grown pretty much exponentially. But if we want to achieve this target of only having the, the Earth's temperature warm up by one and a half degrees Celsius, we will have to reduce our carbon emissions. And these um, sort of purple and blue lines are what we will need to reduce it by year on year if we start reducing and, and going, for, going forward for, for when we start you know, doing that reduction. So far, we haven't done any reducing yet. We're still going up. Um, Hopefully the COVID-19 pandemic, if it does anything good, uh, it will sort of spur us onto movement. But what we're showing here is this is how dramatically we will have to decrease our carbon emissions if we're to meet that, that one and a half degree target. You can see how long it's taken to rise up to where we are you know, today, sort of in the 30 to 40 uh, billion tonnes uh, a year. But to get it down, it's almost a sheer drop. So this is the problem. And the problem is not only that we have caused a certain amount of, of global warming so far. The problem is actually to stop that global warming at a, at, a, at a level that we think is acceptable. We essentially nearly have to have an almost sheer drop in, in, in our carbon emissions. The, the rapid rate at which we need that is in, in itself um, quite a big issue. So why is climate change uh, a problem? Well, climate change directly feeds back on our biodiversity. This is a photo from the, the 2019 to 2020 uh, Australian uh, bushfires, which you may remember um, occurred. And obviously there was enormous cost uh, financially for humans. There was a cost to life in the, in the humans that, that lost their lives in these bushfires, which were unprecedented in their scale and size. And it is not a coincidence that those bushfires were quite so big and quite so vicious. It is not a coincidence that that happened now of all years, you know. The bushfires killed over a billion animals in the area that they, they burned. And one of a particular rare species of gecko had its entire habitat, all of its last known habitat, burned out. So this, in this one event, this was just one wildfire event, it you know decimates biodiversity in that area and there will be more to come. We also know that rising atmospheric temperatures lead to the rise in temperatures of the sea, of the ocean. And we know that for an area like this, this is a coral reef down in, in Southeast Asia, we know that they are, can't really take uh, higher ocean temperatures. Coral is a very delicate organism. And if the ocean rises to too high a temperature, all the coral dies and it just leaves behind its, its skeleton. What you're seeing here is a phenomenon known as, as coral bleaching, Hopefully lots of you will be familiar with it. Um, and what you're seeing here is the skeleton of a coral reef. The coral is dead. This is its skeleton that is left behind. You're literally looking at a coral graveyard. This is an ecologically dead ecosystem now. And then another consequence, of course, of, of, of climate change is the melting of the polar ice caps and the melting of other glaciers as well. And this is going to lead to, to sea level rise. And if sea level, if global sea levels rise by just one meter 
and that is on the lowest lower end of, of what could possibly happen we could see sea level rise of up to sort of five meters six meters if it rises by just one meter that would submerge over 10,000 islands globally now not a lot of people live on those those islands many of them are very small like these ones but there is a huge amount of biodiversity on those islands islands hold a huge amount of, of of the uk's special biodiversity there are so many species that exist on islands and nowhere else they only exist uh, on islands and if you've ever been to an island uh, anywhere in the world actually if you look out for things you'll be able to find special species that you won't be able to find anywhere else to see loads of those submerged in the future would be an enormous loss to to global biodiversity and then i obviously don't want to keep it too depressing but this particularly cute creature is the is the bramble k melamies it's a it's a mouse it uh, lived uh, past tense on an island uh, off of Australia, and unfortunately, this this very cute little uh, little mouse is now extinct. And it's probably the first example of a species that has gone extinct specifically due to climate change. We know that there are other species that humans have caused to go extinct. There's loads of there's loads of examples, but mostly that's through hunting. This is the first one because of climate change. And the reality was that it only lived in one island, again, specialist, that island. And that island was particularly low lying. And the increasing frequency of storms and typhoons and the rising sea levels around that island have pretty much wiped it out. It's now extinct. There will be more extinctions to come from climate change. This is the first that we know of. There may be others that we don't know of. This is the first that we know of, but there will be more to come. And I can only hope that we manage to limit that in the future. But climate change, if this wasn't bad enough as it is, climate change is just the tip of the melting iceberg. There is a whole load of other reasons that biodiversity is under threat that aren't related to the issues that I've that I've just discussed. Drought is related to climate change, but actually there's a huge amount of droughts that are caused just by water mismanagement. Uh, humans taking too much water out of the ecosystem so that they can use it for things like irrigation. How good are we at water management? Not very good in, in, in a lot of cases. So these are human caused droughts, not related necessarily to climate change deforestation we you know deforest vast amounts every year because we want to do land conversion for agriculture or for infrastructure development overfishing and over exploitation of our fisheries and marine bycatch as well is another cost soil erosion when we go through deforestation you lose the the root structure trees have deep roots when you take those away you lose that root structure grass does not have such deep roots the the old adage is that the roots are as deep as the plant is above it grass doesn't have deep roots and so when weather systems come in they can just wash away soil soil erosion is a massive issue pollution pollution of the air pollution of the land and in this example pollution of our water systems both freshwater rivers and of course pollution of our ocean and it's not just pollution with with big lumpy items like plastics and clothing and, and garbage like this but pollution in chemicals as well or untreated sewage that we're dumping into our rivers this is another massive issue it directly affects biodiversity such as these the ganges which is what this photo of is the most polluted it has ever been construction and other development projects from infrastructure taking up an increasing amount of of space and land as we would expect concrete is one of the biggest contributors to to carbon emissions as well the illegal wildlife trade and poaching in this example is obviously elephant tusks but there are loads of other examples as well overgrazing this is a particular example is uh, some of you may actually own some of these items. These are cashmere goats. If you own a, a cashmere jumper or cashmere sweater sort of thing, the massive rise in demand for cashmere has led to there being an explosion in the number of cashmere goats that are farmed in places like this. This is Mongolia. And this leads to massive overgrazing. They're trampling the Mongolian steppe, which otherwise would be you know the biodiversity and habitat the home of, of things like saiga antelope that are now being overgrazed by massive cashmere goat herds trying to respond to a consumer drive and desire for for cashmere sweaters and then finally invasive species uh, a really important one 
this particular example here is, is, is a plant species. It's a ornamental climbing vine plant from uh, Japan and East Asia called kudzu. And in this particular example, it's taken over this area of, of the southern United States. It smothers uh, the land. It grows up trees. It kills off the trees because they don't have any access to sunlight themselves. It will totally carpet the ground so no other plants can grow. And if you can't grow your plants and you don't have plant biodiversity, then you won't have a diversity higher up the food chain because plants are the foundation of, 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 of a healthy and diverse functioning ecosystem. Invasive species are a massive issue, not just plants. We have them here in the UK as well. I'm sure you think of rabbits and you can think of grey squirrels as well and, and, and the damage that they do every year. And so as we can see from a graph like this, the mix is, is a bit varied. All of these things contribute towards loss in biodiversity. Um, but actually, land use change and over-exploitation together usually make up the lion's share of, 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 of the threats. Climate change, as you can see in, in, in red, is not necessarily the major threat to biodiversity in any particular part of the world. Yes, we know what it can do in the future, and the, the Bramble K melamines is just one example of, of what it has done in the past. But actually, land use change and, and over-exploitation are by far and away the problems facing biodiversity right now. And as you can see from a graph like this, we know already that we use up too many resources. If we consider the world's bio capacity, the, the sort of level in which we can we can afford to take up land and we can afford to do things. And we already know that we far exceed that just in the sense of how much carbon we're, we're putting into the atmosphere, let alone all of the land that we're using up and all of the biodiversity that we're that we're taking out. So we need to reduce our resource use in that sense, or at least make it more sustainable or more circular in its, in its economic fashion. And actually, a nice visual of this, this is how we use the world's land. So I said we were taking up lots of land. This is actually what it's being taken up with. 26%, so about a quarter of the, the Earth's terrestrial surface, this is ignoring the, ignoring the seas, is, is taken up by, by forests, which is, which is great. We definitely don't want to see that number fall any lower than it already is. Needless to say that in the past, it was much higher. You've got areas taken up by, by glaciers and permanent snow and ice and barren land that's sort of deserts and, and rocks. And then you've got some land that's taken up by, by freshwater lakes and, and, and rivers and things. And then some land that's, that's shrub. And it's also worth pointing out, we don't just want the whole world to be forests. You know, shrub and, and other types of vegetation is important as well. And only 1% of the Earth's terrestrial surfaces, land surface, is actually villages and towns and cities and infrastructure, an area, well, roughly the size of, roughly the size of Egypt in this, in, um, even um, uh, Libya in this particular example. But, um, but actually, by far and away, the biggest use of land that us humans are involved in is, of course, agriculture, producing the foods that we are going to eat, the food that the people in this 1% need in order to survive. And 7% of the Earth's surface is taken up by, by cropland. So that's land that we're using to, to grow plants that we then eat. But 27% of the Earth's surface, equivalent to roughly both of the Americas together, is taken up by livestock production. So both land that we use directly as pasture for grazing animals and land that we need uh, to grow plants that are crops for animal feed that we then that we then go on to give to to these animals it's a vast area and even though vastly more land is taken up by livestock farming than cropland farming if we actually look at the global calorie supply so where is the whole world getting its calories from 82 percent of the world's calories come from plants only 18 percent of the world's calories come from meat and dairy despite the fact meat and dairy is taking up three, four times as much land as, as, as the world's plants are. That's to sort of illustrate how inefficient actually livestock production is and how much of this land is sort of effectively being wasted. And we have to also remember that this 26% of remaining forest is being eaten into by people who need to convert that land for more livestock and for more cropland. Certainly, you think about palm oil reserves, but you know who are eating it up for for more livestock as well. It's an extraordinary inefficient system, and if we need to know anything, we need a hell of a lot more efficiency in our system if it's ever going to work. 
so biodiversity matters a lot to us. Why does any of this matter? You know, what, 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 you know, what's the relevance of any of this? Biodiversity has an intrinsic value, first of all. Certain habitats also perform functions that are helpful to humans. So you think about drawing down carbon dioxide, plants taking carbon dioxide. Food and materials, we get lots of um, our food from, from wild plants or wild animals, such as fish or non-farmed fish, of course. Recreation, flood regulation, biodiversity and nature has a huge cultural significance to humans. Misusing nature can have unintended negative consequences. And that's sort of my very diplomatic way of saying you might accidentally start a global pandemic. But, you know, we won't delve into that too much um, today. And then global ecosystem collapse would probably be unsurvivable for humans. So that's quite a quite a drastic point to to end on. But I'll illustrate my point further. This is um, the World Economic Forum's assessment of global risks. What's really risky in terms of of of, of the world and particularly um, uh, the world's economy? And on the x axis, you've got likelihood. So as we move towards the towards the right, things get more likely. And as we move up, the higher up we go, the, the bigger the impact is going to be. And biodiversity loss, they assessed in 2018 to sort of be pretty likely and, and quite of, of quite high impact. But it's slowly moved closer and closer. And it's now the third most impactful thing after climate action failure and nuclear weapons. Uh, obviously, nuclear weapons would be pretty bad, but their rate is as pretty unlikely. If you look at this this quadrant, this whole everything in this everything in this um, in this quarter, these are likely things that have bad impact on the world economy, and biodiversity loss is is right up there. If you aren't worried about biodiversity loss and the consequences it will have on the world economy, you definitely should be. And this is just to try and illustrate the point. This is the carbon cycle. Um, there are many, many cycles, nutrient cycles, carbon cycles, water cycle. Many cycles happen on, on Earth. It's part of the Earth system. It's how the Earth has evolved to, to, to work and to function. And there are living organisms here. There are living organisms here, living organisms over here as well. There's biodiversity embedded throughout the carbon cycle throughout the nutrient cycle, throughout the water cycle. You can add on cycle after cycle. I could find some very, very complicated diagrams on Google Images to include. But the best way to think of it is the whole Earth system is like a Jenga tower, OK? And biodiversity is this block, 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 and this block. And if you cause global biodiversity to collapse, it's like taking out all of those blocks in this Jenga tower. And what do you think is going to happen to the Jenga tower if you take out all those blocks? Maybe it will stay up. It's definitely going to be very precarious. Likelihood is the whole thing is going to collapse. And that's the problem. That's what I'm trying to illustrate, is that actually perhaps the human race may be able to overall adapt and survive climate change. If, even if temperatures get really, really hot, maybe we'll be able to adapt to it, you know, have the right flood defenses, move out of areas that are, that are, that are suffering extreme heat and drought. M many people may die, you know, the world's population may become less, but maybe we'll be able to adapt and survive. But once the global biome collapses, once biodiversity across the world collapses, to my mind, there will be no going back. But global biodiversity collapse, is not a survivable scenario for the human species. And that's very sad. I don't think the biodiversity, the global biodiversity is gonna collapse in my lifetime. So hopefully I'll be able to live a full and happy life, but it could happen in my children's lifetime. And it certainly could happen in my grandchildren's lifetime. And that's a pretty worrying thought because I don't really want to burden that with them. And we won't all pay an equal price. It's, it's gonna get worse, I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen. So, Many of us aren't yet feeling the effects of climate change. Um, we sit in somewhere like this, I'm presenting from Oxford and, and you know, things are, are pretty fine here. But for coffee farmers on Mount Kilimanjaro in, in Kenya, they're already feeling the pinch. The temperatures are rising, the average summer is now hotter, the rains are coming later and they're shorter. And this is leading lots of their coffee plants to wilt and die. So their primary source of income is already under threat from climate change. My income isn't, thankfully. I research climate change. I sort of need it to happen in a way. Um, but for them, this is already something that is on their doorstep. 
And there's a variety of different risks across the whole world from hurricanes, wildfires, droughts and, and floods. Everyone will be affected in some ways. But the capacity that we have to respond to those threats is not equal. In the UK, we've become quite used to being able to deal with, with floods. Flooding has happened, um, you know, all the time in, in the UK. And yes, they may get worse and yes, they may get more frequent but we may be able to adapt that. We're very rich and we can, we can afford to do that as a nation. But how might somewhere like Bangladesh or Indonesia respond to the same threats? Do they have the same capacity for action as we do? The answer is, is, is possibly not. You think about the Australian wildfires that I go back to, over 30 people died in those wildfires. That was just you know, one incident and they'll increase in frequency in the future. If those wildfires come to parts of, parts of um, central and, and, and southern central Africa, Will they be able to respond in the same way? I don't think the answer is yes there. And this sort of illustrates the point about flooding, actually. These countries are all very misshapen. They're sized so that the bigger ones have more people who live less than five metres above sea level. So these are the people who are at real risk. And these are the countries that are real risk of, of sea level rise, of their houses and their homes essentially being flooded one day in the future. And as you can see, many of these are in Asia, the Indian subcontinent and, and Southeast Asia in particular. Are these people really able to respond to that threat? Currently, the answer is, is, is probably not very well. And this isn't necessarily much of a coincidence, actually. What this graph shows us is uh, where the forests are at the moment in, in green and uh, in, in, in light green, sorry, and where forests used to be in, in dark green. So we can see, well, who has been, where have the countries been that have done lots of the deforestation in the past? And what we can actually see is that vast amounts of Europe used to be covered in forests, but they're not anymore. India and China used to be covered in forests, they're not anymore. And actually this biodiversity destruction that happened in the past, once upon a time, is a consequence, the consequence of that is that these countries are a lot more biodiversity poor than they used to be. But as a result, they've made quite a lot of money off of that in the process. The reason why I'm able to sit in this lovely house in Oxford is because in the past, this country contributed quite a lot to, to global climate change. It put out a lot of carbon emissions and it destroyed a lot of its biodiversity. That got this country quite rich and able, enabled it to develop quite a lot. But as a result, we are able to deal with the th threats in the future but only because we destroyed our past. Same thing goes with, with carbon, actually. These are cumulative CO2 emissions by world region. And as you can see, back in the olden days, in the 1750s, you know, virtually 100% of, of, of carbon dioxide emissions at that point were emitted by, by, uh, by Europe, excluding um, the, the EU27. The EU27 are, are, are shown here as well. And even up until 1950, Europe and, and, and the EU, you know, still accounted for about 70 to 75 percent of the world's carbon emissions that had been emitted to that point. Now, obviously, countries like um, China and the United States and, and, and Asia in general um, have you know, grown since then. Obviously, they are the major emitters today, but they weren't the major emitters back then. And this is this here is 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 the global picture, everything showed up in, in one go. And obviously the USA as a single country over its entire lifespan has emitted the most carbon. But, you know, things like the EU, this is a little bit outdated because this includes, um, uh, includes the UK. But, you know, the whole of the EU plus the UK emitted more carbon over its entire lifetime than, than China ever has, for example. Even though, you know, China is a, is a massive nation, um, basically bigger than, than the EU at this point. So, the carbon that we emitted in the past has made us rich today and it's enabled us to develop, which is great. And it means that we're able, we're most able to be able to respond to the threats of that climate change in the future. But actually the countries that are being the most affected today, like that example in, in Kenya, I mean, Kenya is not even on, you know, it's one of these smaller squares down here. Kenya didn't contribute that much to the world's carbon emissions, but it's the first ones to feel the impact. And also, because they didn't contribute a lot in the past, they haven't developed as much as we have. And as a result, they're actually the least prepared to deal with the effects that they're going to face the first out of everybody. It's a little bit unfair, but it's the way the cookie has crumbled. 
So what have we done about all of this? You know, what, 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 what have we done? Well, we've had lots of conferences. Conferences are really important. And, and lots of people may remember the Paris, uh, the Paris Climate Conference, which led to the, the Paris Climate Agreement. And this basically agreed that we would keep uh, global climate change and, and, and temperature wise well below two degrees uh, and, you know, aim for, for one and a half degrees uh, Celsius. And this is how we're doing on that, um, actually. So this is where we are at the moment. If we didn't do anything, if we, if we di didn't do anything, basically, we just carried on as normal, then we could expect the Earth's temperature to rise by, you know, even up to as far as, as, as five degrees um, Celsius, which would be uh, a, a struggle to adapt to. But we made a load of policies. You know, we've, we've, we've made a lot of commitments to, to carbon net zero. So that's great. So where, does the, where do those policies get us? Well, those policies get us about here at the moment. This is the sort of trajectory, this orange, that these policies will, will take us on. If all of the policies that our governments have made, if they carry them all off, all of those promises that our governments have made across the, across the world, if they manage to execute them successfully, then this is where we'll, well, this is where we'll go. And then they've made a load of other pledges and targets, which aren't technically um, enshrined in law. But even if we achieve all of those as well, and this is where we'll be heading on this on this yellow. And that's good because that's a lot less than, than this, this doomsday scenario in pink. But as you can see, it's a long way from where we need to be if, if we want to achieve that 1.5 degrees that we agreed to achieve in Paris in 2015. And this is a similar story for biodiversity. So we had, a, we had another conference in, in Nagoya in Japan in 2010, and we decided that for the next 10 years, We'll have a decade on biodiversity and it will be fantastic and it will be it will be so celebratory and uh, we'll also set 20 targets we'll call them the aichi targets uh, are named after the prefecture that that nagoya is um the city of nagoya is in and so there's 20 targets and we'll achieve them and that will be good we can achieve those those 20 targets for biodiversity and and, and everything will be great so i'm going to now show you the graph of, of progress towards those targets. Lots of them were meant to be achieved by 2020, by the end of the decade of biodiversity. And the progress is this. Where you see orange, it's where we've made progress, but not enough to meet the target. Red, no progress. Purple, we're going the opposite direction. Green is where we have done enough progress to meet the target. And then this here, blue, is where we've done so much progress, we're going to overshoot the target which is great. But as you can see, across all of these targets, here are the 20 targets, and each one of these graphs represents the, the sub-target. There, there were targets within targets. As you can see, across all of the 20 targets and their sub-targets, um, it's not been very successful. So why aren't any of these things working? Why are we not going far enough? Well, there's lots of reasons, really. There's difficulty in agreeing what to measure biodiversity by, mismatches in, in national action and global indicators, taking action is expensive, action requires the public to change their behavior. Our targets, they're not smart, so they haven't got a specific thing we can measure them by. It's sort of like restore nature. Well, what does that mean? When by? How are we going to measure that? What do those things mean? And it's difficult to get different sectors and scales to work together, but to be honest with you, the overriding reason why things aren't working is, is lack of political will. And there's lots of reasons why there's a lack of political will. One of them is the fact that at the moment, political parties just do not, across the world, do not see this as, as, a, as, as a deal breaker issue at the ballot box for, for democracies anyway. Obviously there are plenty of, of non-democracies that are also uh, have, have a lack of political will. Um, and, that's, and that's a bit of a problem, but it's not gonna be the focus of, of, of this talk. Instead, I'd like to talk about what we've done, our four steps. Now, these are three steps that are on the screen at the moment, and hopefully lots of you will be familiar with them. Reduce, reuse, recycle, um, or whichever, reuse, reduce, recycle, whichever way you want to say it, and it comes with this sort of uh, three symbol Mobius strip thingy-majiggy. And this had its origin, this, this uh, three word phrase, which hopefully everybody is, is familiar with. This had its origin in, in around the 1970s in the, the burgeoning environmental movement. And for a long time, it was the core mantra of environmentalism and, and sustainability, but it only focuses on waste really. So reuse, reduce, and, and recycle what waste you can. So it's it's realistically it was it was waste, which is outputs focus. It's not focusing on the inputs of of, of the system, 
if we think about the world as a system, waste is a problem, but actually, you know, it's what we're putting into the human system that's that's the, that's the big one. And to be honest with you, I see this now as a little bit of a sticking plaster on a gaping wound. Reduce, reuse, recycle seems terribly out of fashion, out of fashion in my in my view. It used to be the key thing that they taught us in school when I was at when I was at primary school, but actually given the context of the scale of destruction that our biodiversity faces and the scale of the challenge in reducing our carbon emissions, reduce, reuse, recycle sort of seems, uh, well, a little bit insufficient. So we came up with something else. We've come up with something we called the mitigation conservation hierarchy. That's its technical and academic name. But um, in this talk, I'll just refer to it as four steps for the earth because it, or the four steps is nice and easy to, to remember. And this is a conceptual framework for implementing global sustainability goals by all actors, including you and me listening to this talk at international, national and subnational levels. So at all levels, all people at all levels. And I'll explain how that works. The framework itself has two halves. The first half is mitigation. That's the reactive half. We need to take actions to react against the environmental impacts that we're causing right now. So if we are chopping down forests to build a mine, if we are building new housing, if we're flying or if we're traveling by car, we are causing environmental impact. And we need to think about how we are going to mitigate against that. We're going to react against that. So this is in contrast with the second half, which is conservation. And that's about being proactive. So what actions do we need to take to proactively build a sustainable world for the future? Do we need to help with species conservation? Do we need to create new areas of, of, of green space? And so within those four halves, within those two halves even, there are four steps. The first step is always to refrain. So it's preventative. How can I refrain from causing impact by cutting out actions? Do I need to take this unnecessary car journey? Do I need to take this unnecessary flight, for example? And then it's about reducing. So once we've stopped doing things, we need to reduce our impact by carrying out action using more sustainable methods. So I'm still going to eat fish, but can I switch to eating uh, MSC certified fish, sustainable fish instead? And then it's about restoration. So this now moves into compensatory actions. The first ones were about preventing uh, damage from happening in the first place. The second half is about compensating for the damage that we have caused. So we need to restore damaged nature back to what it should be like. And then step four, the final one is renew. And this is about being aspirational. We need to renew by building new transformational future-proofed landscapes. We can restore forests and we can restore wildfire meadows. But there are lots of places that we can't restore. Think about central London, for example. What are we going to restore that to? Well, it's always going to be central London. I mean, there's no, there's no going back now. But we can renew it into something like this. I think this is around the sort of Fleet Street um, area. And many of you may be quite familiar with, with central London. But this is a vision of what London might look like in the future. And actually, if, if the COVID-19 pandemic has, has, has shown us anything, it's that we actually quite seem to seem to quite like alfresco dining and, and, and visiting alfresco cafes. So I don't see why um, more streets in the future won't, won't be pedestrianized or to an extent pedestrianized um, and, and give that space back to, to nature and, and to people as well. This isn't a restoration project. We're not restoring anything that used to exist. This is renewal. This is about taking a landscape and transforming it into something that's appropriate for the future. And I think that this is a, a lovely example of, of what perhaps London could look like. I would certainly want to live in that version of London rather than the, the, the version that exists uh, today. And so what, um, what we, we sort of have, if we bring all of those bits together, you've got your, your four steps here in the different shades of green. You've got the loss that we have to, to mitigate against. So this is the, 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 the impact that we're having, the negative impact. And it's negative, hence it goes below zero in this, in this graph. And then we've got conservation potential, the stuff that we can do, the nature that we can restore with conservation. And it's, and it's positive, it's above the, the zero on the baseline. And that's why we have the conservation part of the hierarchy. It's a hierarchy because it's got four steps and they go in order. And you've got the mitigation part of the hierarchy. And if we add these things together, 
hopefully we've got this lovely outcome for biodiversity. But it's worth noting also that, as I said, two of those steps, the first two are, 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 are prevention based, they're preventing impact. And the second two are, are compensation, it's compensating for damage to nature. And it's fair to say that compensation is controversial. This is a controversial topic that we're, we're presenting to you. I'm not gonna present this to you as something that everyone agrees with. Yes, 22 institutions came together to come up with this, this theory, but certainly compensation is, is a controversial concept. This is a whole load of examples of, of what do these actually look like, but I'll just highlight a, a couple for you. Let's imagine we want to refrain from damage that we're causing and the overarching goal is to restore biodiversity through supply chains, thinking about the, the, the supply chains for food or for, for our clothing. So the first thing, a refrain step would be do not source from suppliers associated with the hunting of wild species to protect their livestock. So that would be something we could refrain from doing um, about the, the, the mitigation half. Let's think of another example now. So a reduction step in the conservation half of the priority. We could invest in research and development for sustainable grazing and then share those lessons learned and lobby the industry to adopt best practice. So that would be about changing the practices that we're doing. We're not refraining from the activity, but we change the way we do it so that it has less impacts. Now let's think about those compensatory actions. So restore in the conservation pathway, we could invest in pollutant cleanup efforts in historically polluted terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. So we could clean up pollution that's been in the past. Now that's not reactive because it, it, if it's in the past, it sort of happens. So we don't know exactly who did it, but we can take up responsibility for that. That's why it's proactive. And then finally, if we think about renewal in a, for carbon emissions in, in, a, in a mitigation reactive sense, invest in carbon offsets might be example. And, and carbon offsetting is to a degree controversial as well, but that might be where, where you go for that example. So there's lots of examples here, but we won't worry too much about them. Those are just a, a flavor of different things we could do. And it's all about something like this. We call this bending the curve. This is, if you think about, this is nature, okay? The whole of nature. And this is where it was in the past. In the past, it was high and it's been decreasing. And if we don't do anything in gray, it will continue to decrease. If we do some conservation, then it will sort of perhaps flatten out. But what we really need is we need conservation to be mixed with dealing with our impacts so that we can bend it so that it actually maybe even breaks even with you know, what it is today, or perhaps even ends up being something um, like it was in the past once upon a time. We can't change the trajectory that biodiversity is heading on unless we unite all of those different sectors together. So what problems are these four steps uh, going to solve, actually? Well, I'm going to give a very brief example um, in bycatch. So we mentioned bycatch earlier. Obviously, fishing, um, fishing is something that occurs globally. And there's a mixture of bycatch, both bird related often and obviously unintended um, uh, marine species, both mammals like dolphins and, and unintended caught uh, fish species as well um, as part of the process of fishing. So what can we do to, to mitigate that? Well, lots of people might say we should have campaigns to, to end fishing. And there have been a few bits in the media recently about, about banning fishing or, or moving away from, from fishing altogether. But I think that often these are unhelpful and, and pretty heavy handed solutions. There are people all over the world that rely on, on fishing as, as their livelihood. It is their job. They don't really have a lot of other alternatives because they don't really have much of an education. This is their livelihood. This is their source of income. Taking this away from them is not really going to solve anything. In fact, if anything, it often pushes people to engaging in things like illegal wildlife trade. And so one of our PhD students at the university here, Holly Booth, um, is based in Indonesia and um, and interviews farmers, you know, just like this one, uh, not farmers, sorry, fishermen, just like this one, uh, for whom fishing is their livelihood. So actually, when you think about saying something like, oh, well, I'm not going to eat any more fish, and actually the whole world should give up on fish, well, that may be easy for, for us to say, but actually think about the consequences for the global economy of, of, of that sort of thing. This isn't really a, a viable solution for everyone else. So instead, we could use those four steps for about, about thinking about fishing bycatch. So we could avoid by 
making sure that we don't fish in a particular area when we know that these certain birds are going to be foraging in that area, for example. We can minimize by changing our gear. So there's lots of examples of, of trawling is obviously very bad for fishing and, and line and pole fishing is, is, is much better. There are other techniques, you know, like switching from, from J hooks to circle hooks, which actually increases turtle survival. Then there's a certain amount of compensation we can do. So if you catch a turtle, you might be able to send it into a, to a rescue center and they might be able to release it later on. That's a form of, of, of sort of uh, restoration that you might be able to, to do. And then there could be things like offsetting. So we know that our fishing fleet are, are catching, you know, 20 turtles a year. Well, why don't we actually rear, hand rear um, by humans, hand rear um, turtle eggs and then release turtles into the sea to try and make up for that? And this is a, a quick example of, of, of actually just how that works. This example is the, is the flesh footed shear water. Um, all of Australia's population of, of flesh-footed shearwaters are found on this one island, islands again, uh, Lord Howe Island, uh, off, the coast of, off the coast of Australia. What we have actually shown in this particular piece of scientific research is that if you actually focused on controlling the invasive species, again, uh, the invasive species population of rats on Lord Howe Island, it would be 23 times more cost effective in the short term in reducing the mortality of the flesh footed shearwater than trying to change the types of fishing tackle that, that the fishing feet uh, uses. Now, so why not actually, whilst we're waiting for the evolution and the next level of technology in, in, in fishing, why not instead say, look, um, the fishermen and the fishing fleets and the industrial fishing fleets should spend their money on perhaps a rat eradication project on Lord Howe Island and then bring in these new technologies when they've actually been developed. Um, as I said, this is in the short term, but this is a highly controversial idea that the fishing fleet could just pay to do something elsewhere rather than tackling with their own impact. But it's, it makes a certain degree of sense in this particular, uh, particular scenario, but it is controversial. And so this leads us to the last, you know, the last concept, basically. Um, the whole point about these four steps is that different countries that are at different levels of development can choose different things. So in a country that's biodiversity rich, but less wealthy, then it's going to want to do lots of avoidance because it's got a lot of biodiversity, but it's not going to want to spend a lot of money on, on doing restoration projects. These nations often biodiversity rich because they are at an earlier stage in their development. They haven't destroyed their biodiversity yet. We need to protect primary biodiversity but we can't deny nations what we have. We can't just say to a nation, well, you can't develop because we need to protect all this biodiversity when we have, you know, you know, famously not done that. And this might be an example for the UK. It's a heavily degraded landscape, but it's a wealthy country. We've not got a lot to avoid. We mostly destroyed it all many hundreds of years ago. So we can spend most of this money on, on restoration in order to sort of get to our um, get to a, a level of biodiversity that's good. It's no coincidence that the UK is, is biodiversity poor. We destroyed that biodiversity a long time ago, and we see the benefit of that today. But we need to set ourselves on a path to recovery. So actors need to be flexible in what they do and, and given their circumstances. And um, these four steps will also help the coordination of actions under a united framework towards a, towards a common goal. We'd be able to, to pick out actually, you know, who's cheating and who's greenwashing. An example is, is, is one like this. These are the four steps. They've been given slightly different names here, but they mean the same thing, more or less. But these are still the four steps. If you're doing something that's focusing on a lot of avoidance, then that's good. If you're trying a strategy like strategy three, where a lot of your a lot of all of your, you know, your your hard work is based on 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 offsetting, on based on you know making up for loss you're causing elsewhere. And we can notice this and say that actually maybe this is just greenwashing. And actually, when you see a company make a pledge, think to yourself, is this actually where where does this pledge sit? You know, what kind of action is this? Is it a low down action? Is it a, a core preventative action or is this some sort of compensatory action higher up? And that's a that's a hallmark of greenwashing. The, 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 this target has um, this framework has an aspirational basis that demands that you have proactive targets and it's about implementation it's about what are we actually going to do 
not about you know what's the theory of, of, of what we could do and this is you know this is the sort of principle it works at the international level in in, in this sense this is sort of all of the different international bodies that exist, including the, the UN and the Sustainable Development Goals and, and CITES, which, which control um, the, the illegal wildlife trade and, you know, what all of how these different international bodies could use the four steps. But actually, the core behind this is, is individuals. You know, what can you and I, you know, personally do? And, you know, there are some examples of how we might work this through. We might apply this to our food. You know, can we avoid consuming high biodiversity food items like tea and coffee and, you know, often cakes and sugars or or meat as well? Um, same goes for our fashion or our textile choices. You know, how many how much leather do we really need to, to purchase? How much high pesticide or high water use cotton do we need to purchase? Are we purchasing products that have been made in sweatshops? How many products are you actually purchasing? What's your what's your turnover rate for clothes? Do you need to really be, you know, propping up this much turnover? So this is something that can be applied to to individuals' lives as uh, uh, just as easily. These 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 four steps. And then finally, this this is my last point. It's all about uh, transparency. It's all about being transparent. But transparent is is a double edged sword in this sense, because conservationists are already pretty selective about what they mean by biodiversity where we decide you know what species are the priority species and conservation is is full of value-laden trade-offs that are already made but they're either implicit or they're just undisclosed what we would do with the four steps towards working towards clearly stated goals it requires your assumptions and your calculations to be laid bare and to be explicit and this is what causes a lot of controversy. It brings into the open those trade-offs and those value judgments that actually people are already making. They've always been there in the background. The four steps brings them to the fore, pardon the pun. That's really important because we need to be transparent with each other about how we're going to deal with this problem. And so this controversy isn't new. This controversy is bringing into the, into the light stuff that we've previously just left undiscussed. So my final conclusions then, the world is in a climate crisis, a biodiversity crisis, and there is a, a big social element and an economic element to that crisis as well. And we need a joined up framework to be able to solve those, those elements together. We've created our four steps for the earth and it's, it's got those two halves, reactive and proactive. It's designed to reactively deal with our current impacts and proactively feel, build the future we need. Same targets, what can we do you know, on both halves to sort of bend that curve, change that trajectory totally? It's flexible, it sets an easy reporting framework for transparency and it pushes people to be ambitious. What is your proactive target? You can't just not set one. And then we can't discount biodiversity. We can't just focus on carbon emissions. We can't use heavy handed approaches. We need nuance and we need to bring in all these other elements as well. There is a little bit of positivity, actually, I wanted to say, you know, this has been a, perhaps a bit of a negative talk. This is the 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 drinking water service coverage that the, the, the world has. You know, since the year 2000, over a billion more people have got access to at least basic drinking water services. This is the number of people in extreme poverty since 1990. The number has more than halved. This is the amount of renewable energy that the United Kingdom is, has been using since 1990. For a long period of time, it was essentially flat. In the last decade, it has absolutely ballooned and it will continue to do so. And then this is the number of, of, of people in school, um, uh, versus boys versus girls, um, that are enrolling in school. For every country on this list, bar just a couple, more people have been enrolling in school and more girls have been enrolling in school. It's more equal across the world. We've seen a huge amount of change in just my lifetime, actually. And there's a huge amount of optimism about how quickly things can change when we really want them to. And if you haven't visited the Conservation Optimism website, there are some fantastic, um, you can find just seven stories of optimism. There's some fantastic stories of, of conservation really going um, really going well and stories of success across the world. It's, it's very easy to focus on the negative, but there's a huge amount of, of positive work that's being done and positive change that is happening quicker than ever. 
So that's the end. Uh, that's all that I wanted to say. You can check both of the four steps uh, for the Earth out on Twitter and, and my own personal uh, Twitter as well that I use uh, to communicate some of our science. And you can visit our website as well. But that is, in essence, our four steps uh, for the Earth. So, uh, Chris, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hand back to you. And I appreciate that I have not left a great deal of time for questions, but I'm happy to, to overrun just slightly. But I appreciate lots of people will have uh, have dinner to go to at, at, at 8 p.m. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. That's wonderful, Henry. And, and we have had lots of questions in there. Um, and I think I really better start with with um, um, Marion's question. So she she says, if you, as you say, and we know the biggest obstacle is political will, how can research projects like this put direct influence on governments and, and key policymakers? Uh, this must be something, you, you, you know, you battle about continually. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, we, the, we have the advantage being in the University of Oxford that we're very close to a lot of policymakers and a lot of our um, academic staff directly feed into um, directly feed into the, the political system. And actually, if anything, if you think about the political landscape, it has changed so dramatically over the past decade. You know, 10 years ago in 2010, you think about the, the 2010 general election. I'm not sure how many people remember it, where we had that, that coalition government at, at, at the end. How many people were talking about environmental issues? How many politicians were talking about environmental issues? None. Virtually, you know, it wasn't it wasn't something that was discussed. Today, you know, well, in in the 2019 general election, all of the major parties had commitments around planting trees, which is a bit, you know, light touch, but you know, not not um not uh, you know, not to be sniffed at. All of them had commitments around net zero and the introduction of electric vehicles on our streets. This is now something that people are talking about. And it's not just actually our academics. It's things like Extinction Rebellion. It's things like the the, the school um, the school strike for climate. You know, some of those can be quite extremist in the in the way they go about things, but they get their message through. They get the attention that they they require, and they and slowly they start to shift. But actually, the shift that we've seen in in politics has been really dramatic. And it's re we're really fortunate that when politicians start to realise that maybe there's there's something in this they often turn to institutions like Oxford straight away and say, what can we do to, to help this? And we hope to present our um, our four steps framework to, to the global politicians of, of the world at the, uh, at the Kunmi. To be down to the fact that she's, she says, how are we going to make the big changes necessary? necessary? I mean, one thing she says that uh, it seems to her that it, it would be en ending intensive farming, but but she asks, you know, do we need a whole new economic system? Is that is that sort of what you think might be putting uh, politicians off from implementing some of these these changes? So I didn't, yeah, yeah, I didn't speak too much about economics um, in 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 this. Um, recently, the government, the, the UK government, of course, this isn't, you know, this is just the UK, recently published uh, its Descupta review report, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, it's quite a heavy and long report, but it reviewed basically what is the future of the economic system in the UK with regard to biodiversity. And the conclusion of that report was that, very simply, and this is something that's accepted by, by um, the government treasury, it is impossible for growth to be uh, infinite, essentially. We cannot continue, GDP cannot continue to rise forever and ever and ever. There is going to become a point where GDP sort of ends up basically flattening out and that's because if we continue to use the world's resources in the way that we're currently doing in order to see gdp increase then we'll run out of resources and gdp will crash because we don't have any more resources to to fuel that rise in, in gdp so what you need is you need to have not just sustainability inherently that means you have to have a sustainable economy and the two concepts i might present would be the concept of a circular economy which isn't that drastic it's sort of you know, it, it, it's a version of capitalism in that sense. And then the concept of the donut economy, um, which is one that's been pioneered by by Kate Raworth, um, who is based at the University of Oxford. You can um, Google donut economics. And it's, again, sort of not directly in conflict with the idea of, of the capitalist economic system per se. But the emphasis is on how do we find an economic model that enables humans to essentially be rich enough and developed enough that we meet all the relevant social criteria so that people aren't living in poverty and that people have access to education and that you know people have electricity and, and food and water um, and even can live you know semi-luxurious lives um, 
but not breach the, the Earth's boundaries. And so I think that a model like that is, is probably something that, that we will evolve into into the future, but I think it will be a gradual transition. Uh, there are a lot of people out for the, that care that we need. And, and Anna sort of joins in there with um, a possible solution. She says, what do we think of, of a household carbon or biodiversity budget or guide that can be, you know, roughly told you know what carbon or biodiversity loss each each um, task takes so that people can actually arrange their activities within that um, so um, I wonder what you thought about that that idea of having um, those sorts of packaging guides for for individuals mm. so I think the emphasis at the moment or the, the, the sort of trend for 2021 will be you know individuals have to start taking more responsibility and there are various different ways that you can go about doing this. The trend I see it in the future, and this will inev become inevitable, is that governments will have to take a more proactive approach in basically policing the lives of their citizens. And they'll inevitably be trapped into doing this by the, the, the political commitments they've made and the, the realization that the action that they need and the results they need have to come a lot quicker than, than they can effectively afford to do. And so, for example, I can see that in the future, you know, a lot of meat that we that we that we eat in the UK will have VAT added onto it in order to, to discourage you from buying too much. That's when I think people will start caring. Um, mm. And if, if you don't care about it now, you'll start caring when it when it hits you in the future that actually the government have a lot of pledges to meet and they're not going to meet all those pledges just by selling electric cars. Um, they're going to have to start affecting your life. So my advice to everyone is. Uh, get those changes in early, you know, gradually wean yourself onto 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 a life, um, onto a low carbon lifestyle. Uh, otherwise, you might face a much more abrupt um, awakening later on, uh, later on down the line. But something like a carbon budget, um, I think that actually, you know, as a concept might work in the future. Certainly, we know that there will be taxes implemented on on the most frequent flyers uh, in the future. That will definitely happen at some point in the future. And then it will become a point where um, it might be literally unaffordable to fly more than you know one one return flight a year. Many of us go on perhaps one. Uh, we used to go on one foreign journey uh, for a holiday. You know, each year it might become impossible. It may become literally unaffordable to be able to do uh, to be able to do more than that in the future. Um, the emphasis being that you need to you know you need to fly less or, or things like that. But I don't see why uh, you know the government will in the future, and this may be 10 years away, maybe 20 years away, uh, take quite an interve interventionist approach. Governments across the world take quite an interventionist approach on this matter as they realise that the results are not coming quickly enough. Yeah, I think that's a, a great point. That actually leads me to, to what I think must be our, our last question, actually, um, which is um, you, you're talking about uh, possibly VAT going on meat and things, and there was a, certainly a little bit of a, an argument ranging in the uh, in the in the chat between uh, Harry and and Kaylin, or a discussion, I should say, not an argument. Um, uh, talking about eating less meat and, uh, and Harry said well eating less meat would be very helpful you know and most people from a rich country could live without meat you know these days uh, and Caroline says well the, the story's more subtle than that um, the question is the type of meat farming and how it's done so he, he points to an example in the Bavarian Alps where he says well you know sort of actually the type of farming up there is very beneficial for for alpine plant diversity so uh, what's, what's your opinion do, do we do we sort of get rid of meat or you know how or you know sort of a, yeah, yeah. Do we need to change the agrarian system somehow so so a couple of my colleagues population will be will be on a on a you know vast majority vegan diet um i take a, a slightly different view i do think that there is scope and this is a controversial view to a, to an extent i do think there is scope for us to be able to consume um all sorts of of, of meat both beef and, and pork and, and lamb and fish as well and seafood um, within our diets in a sustainable fashion in the future. But it is just a question of what is the quantity? Um, and I will not deny that all of the data I know of tells us that the quantity of meat consumption is going to have to be much, 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 much lower than it is presently. Um, there is no other way of putting that. And that in the future, it will be the sort of thing where I can eat my beef but beef is 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 a special thing that I have once a month 
sort of scenario. Actually, at the moment during lockdown, um, I'm, I'm living on a on a nearly entirely pescatarian diet. But um, but um, but certainly, you know, after lockdown, I may have you know more more beef at a restaurant or something like that. I don't think it's impossible that we could we can rear that stuff sustainably sustainably in the future. But it is going to have to be a drastic at drastically lower quantities. And then it becomes a question of well, you know, what land is then going to produce the the, the small amount of of meat um, and and farmed fish and farmed uh, seafood that we're eating? And it may be that cases such as those, you know, Bavarian cows are one of the examples of of, of where we where we are able to 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 to, um, to still produce meat. In the UK, I think we will still be able to produce beef and lamb and and and, and pork as well. But it's going to be at a slower. Uh, it's going to be at a much lower scale, and as a result, the you know the economies of scale would tell us that if we're going to produce it as a lower quantity, then it's going to be at a higher quality, and that will be the emphasis on high quality, low environmental impact uh, farming overall at a much lower quantity than than we are today. I think the the realities of saying, well, we could do this and we could do that here are, are, are a little bit academic in the scale of reduction that's required. But what we have to remember as well is that it's, you know, I could go vegan tomorrow. Well, I'd struggle, but I could go vegan tomorrow. I'll probably be fine. For 85% of the world, um, the concept of they are going to have to eat meat to, to, to get the requisite protein until those protein alternatives are available to them. But I'd also like to actually highlight as my final point, that even uh, today, I said that um, you know seven percent of the world's terrestrial surface is cropland, and twenty-seven percent of it is, is is livestock. And I said that the the calorie um, the calorie shift is you know eighty percent calories have actually come from our plants, and 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 much less come from our our beef and our, and our meat and dairy. It's the same thing with with our protein. You'd think, where does the world get its protein from? Well, it must get it from its meat. Over sixty percent of the protein we consume comes from plants. Um, even though we're producing, you know, all of this land is set aside for livestock farming. Over 60 percent of the protein that we're consuming comes from plants. So if you think you have to eat meat and fish to get your protein, uh, that's not true either. So a possible answer is uh, is eating beans and possibly some of the pest species like munchak deer that uh, that eat those. So uh, I think uh, that's absolutely fascinating talk, Henry. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and, and telling us all about the four steps to save the earth. And I will just remind people if you want to watch this again or if you want to, you know, pick up on some of those finer details and share those with uh, with friends and family um, or even organisations, then Henry's talk is going to be on our YouTube channel um, in the next couple of days. Um, also, obviously, we have the tag in here of, of Henry's Four Steps to Save the Earth and the website there of the, uh, the Mitigation and Conservation Hierarchy. So do visit that if you want more information. But it's wonderful to hear from you, Henry. And um, we're looking forward to, uh, to uh, uh, looking forward to seeing you soon. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Um, I hope you found that, that useful as well as interesting. And um, we look forward to seeing you at our next event.